Hey, 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 how are you? You are that band that, that I, I'll bet you if you talk to 100% of the DJs that were on the air when you guys first appeared on the music scene, we would know exactly what we were doing when your first single popped on the air. Oh, dude, I love that. Good. Back in the day. Oh, my God, it was back in the day. It was back in the day when we were live, and there wasn't enough information about you guys, and we were calling up the, the A&R people and the, and the record reps going, tell us more about this band so we can say more than just the title of the song. Oh man, I love really. I love that. I mean, well, that was that was the mystery of the pre uh, pre internet days. Yeah, you know, you didn't know who they were. There was mystery, and that was really compelling as a music fan. You know, well, we relied so much on Rolling Stone magazine and everything else, and it's like, okay, but but is this really the true story? And because you know, you don't want to feed the listeners anything that's that's like, oh, that's not real. I've known these guys for fifty years. I know, right? Right. Uh, well, well, now, now the, all the information is out there. There's not a lot of mystery, but th that's cool too. You know, it, it's good to be able to dig in and and kind of see w w what a, a band or a songwriter is connected to and what they do. I, I dig going down that rabbit hole, but there was something cool to the '90s when you did know, and and there was that mystery. Yeah, yeah. Plus, music was changing so quickly at that point in time. It was going in so many different directions, and and music fans were were going right along with you guys. Well, yeah. Well, look, Ezra. You know that, that there was that big explosion of uh, of alternative rock that was a reaction, I think, to you know the overproduced stuff of the late '80s and or the '80s, and um, so we were able to come out with this really raw, you know. 12 song actually 14 song album we recorded in one night at a rehearsal studio that was really just <laughs> super rocking you know and it went on to sell almost 5 million copies you know and you don't that doesn't happen anymore no um and, and it was a real it was a moment we got to be a part of and and the fun thing is is you know, now when we play those songs live, it sounds just like the record because that's what it was. There yep. wasn't a lot of overdubbing and stuff. It was just us. And uh, so maybe that's why we're still successful on tour. And look, we're playing tonight with Train at a sold out amphitheater in, in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And, uh, and life is good. Wow. So when you sat down to help out with Mystified, I mean, did, did you turn into the perfectionist or were you like, ah, back it down, guys? We got to make this sound like it just happened. Um, you know, Mystified was written one uh, in, in about three hours. It was me and this songwriter, Henry Brill. He's this British guy who's just this amazing lyricist. And I, and I, at the night before the session, I was talking with my wife just about her being born in the Midwest in Topeka and then moving out to Lodi, California and, and, how, and how different it was. And that, that informed the lyrics to the song. You know, I wanted it. I wanted to, to be up tempo and just feel really anthemic in a Bruce Springsteen kind of way, nice. and that's definitely what we got. Yeah, yeah, you can definitely feel that now that you say that. It's like, oh, of course, that's it. That's part of the attraction. Oh yeah, oh for, for sure. And I and I just love, yeah, I, I love songs that are that are narratives that tell a story, a, you know, a character and and cities and and uh, those are my favorite songs. And and it felt. You know, it feels appropriate that Mystified is the first single we put out in a long time. It's the it's the first single from an album because it feels like it sounds like a better than Ezra song. Yeah, and you know what's great about it? It's coming out here at the tail end of the summer months, but it's got a wintertime feel and a springtime feel to it too. And because I remember being at radio stations, they would program their music around the seasons. This song can fit into any season. That it, it, it's timeless, is what you're saying. Yes, timeless yes, class. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You know, it's funny. I remember, you know, like, oh, this is our summer song. Yep. This feels like, you know. Yep, yep. And then there was that time when there were those all those big six, eight songs like Iris by the Goo Goo Dolls. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and and suddenly when you, re you had to release that big six, eight waltz ballad around, you know, September. Yep. You know, so it would really start hitting in November before everything shut down for the holidays. It was a funny game. Oh, it was so true because as, as a mobile entertainer, my God, we depended on you guys. We needed that power ballad. 
Oh, hell yeah. I, I wrote a lot of them. Jesus. Ne- <laughs> I never could get write one as good as Iris, though. <laughs> you know, you were talking about the different cities and stuff that you guys travel in. What is it like to keep going back to them decade after decade? Because the, the thing is, is that d- does each city change for you? Or do you have certain areas you go, oh, man, we're, we're going to Charlotte. I know exactly where we're going to end up eating. Uh, it, it's, it's the latter. You know, we, we become we enjoy touring now more than we ever had. And I think it's because we just do it smart. We do it, we do it well. We're comfortable when we, when we, we, we make sure we have a nice bus and a, and a crew that's really cool and we get along with, and we loved going to have, you know, great meals. And like we had a night off uh night before last in Cincinnati where we played last night and we went and saw a Cincinnati Reds game. Oh and then God. Oh, we did. Wow. So we, and, and, and so we were, we were right on the third baseline. We saw that, then we had reservations at this place called Soto, which is a James Beard award-winning chef's restaurant in downtown Cincinnati. So we just met, you know, one thing I've found is most cities that we've gone to have gotten better. Yep. Meaning like certain cities that were like, Na- look, I live in Nashville. Nashville was lame in the nineties. <laughs> there was no restaurants, no <laughs> hotels, you know, then, then there are other places like doubt, like Louisville's, you know, great. Um, Different cities have had these renaissance, uh, uh, you know, w- within their downtown where money's come back in. Old warehouses are now cool lofts. Yep. Restaurants have come in. So, so what I've found is that that since the '90s, there's been a real big trend to rediscovering the magic of downtown and, and everything it has to offer, where, wherever that city is. Yeah. Joe Perry once told me that he he would go into a city and he would learn it by its echo in in the arena or wherever you were playing. Do you find yourself doing that too? Because when you go up to when you're on that stage doing that sound check, it's like, oh damn it! I remember when I was here the last time. Uh, you know what? I do most of the times though. It's something about the room that you didn't like. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, because when you're playing a big room like tonight, a big outdoor amphitheater, it, there's a lot of isolation. Like last night we were at Bo- – we, we played Bogarts, which is about a about a 2,000-seat uh, club in, in Cincinnati. And you get back there and you go down to the dressing room and you're like, oh, I remember this place. <laughs> <laughs> but but but, but it, it's a, some fresh coats of paint. Um, but yeah, you, 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 you remember certain things about rooms, things that are good, things that are bad, things you got to kind of compensate for. And it's kind of just like seeing an old friend. Yep, yep, yep. Hey, we've got something in common, and, and that is we're both authors. Your book, The Greatest Song, comes with a five-song EP. My last two books came with music. Dude, what is it about when we're writing in books that we are creative through sound? Um, It's all connected. It is. You know, it's all – and that's what I found. Look, and, and that's part of what the book is about, you know, that, that the things that you can do in business to be – successful and inspired and creative throughout your career are also things that will lend itself to your personal life. And so I like that, you know, so writing music, uh, it's all, it's all connected. And look, this, this was a story about set in a music world, but that's awesome that you, that you're an author too. Congratulations. Oh my God. I, I, I can't quit writing. I've, I've been a writer since second grade. It, it's the one thing that, that is, has always been my mainstay. And I think that's the only reason why I'm in radio is because I get to talk what I've written. Oh, well, what, what were your, what, tell me about your book. Well, my last one was about John Lennon. I believe that he's still alive. He's got Alzheimer's. And, and you know what's so crazy about that is as I was putting that book together, um, Glenn Campbell's family reached out to me. And that's when I started learning more about Alzheimer's and how creative people oh, wow. still keep going. Well, you know, Alzheimer's, there's, we've all seen the interviews with people who are suffering from dementia, who, who music is the one thing that breaks through the fog, you know, it it can bring, you know, a musician out of, you know, complete, you know, listlessness. And so look, that's a good thing for musicians, you know, uh, uh, but it also keeps those, those neural pathways open, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so look, let's hope, I I hope that music for me is something that, that keeps me sharp into my 90s yeah you know one of the things that i find inspiring about you is that you really do help other creatives out because you've got you've got five daily steps that you do that that really opens up the mind to just let me receive it let me deliver it and then let me send it out to those that need to have it yeah well look i mean 
what I found, I started, I wrote the book because I got asked to do a speech <laughs> to a business group, yep. uh, about seven years ago. And, and the, and the speech took off and I, I, I go and speak from, to companies from Disney and Nike and Google and Salesforce all around the country. And, um, and I realized that, oh, there's certain things that I've, I, I actually do to stay um, inspired and competitive mm -hmm. and knowing the business of my business and leaving my comfort zone and changing my angle of approach. I'm kind of at a standstill, you know, and it's things that all people, all people can do. Um, and it look, and there, there's a reason that, you know, music is a fickle business, but here I am, I'm 54 years old, you know, and I, I go and I, like, I'll get off the road, you know, in a couple of weeks, for a little bit and I you know the next day I'm in a session with a, a, a band of you know 20 year olds you know and then the next day is is a you know a, a female duo yep. country duo and the next day is an alt rock band and um and I just love music and so I have to I have to stay I have to stay inspired and you know evolving and you can do it that's that's the that's the big reveal it's like oh I can still be inspired and bring something creatively yeah do, do you see that creativity is a, a is an addiction or do you think it's feeding something else huh that's interesting um i think that creativity maybe it is an addiction look i have to create Me if too. i if i <laughs> yeah. feel like i'm if i'm like if i to a fault if i don't if i feel like i'm not being productive you know i'm, I'm not creating stuff I get real ill at ease and sometimes my wife just says, Hey, relax. You do enough. You work hard enough. Just, you don't have to be doing anything. Just relax. And, and I, but, but our minds tell us one thing in reality is often very different. Uh -huh. So now the, the tour, you, this is becoming a tradition because I mean, you're, you're out there on the road going into these cities. I mean, are you seeing the same people and then the, now they're bringing their kids? Uh, it's amazing. Like last night, we we played a show. There was uh, a, a a guy who's been seeing us for thirty years. He had his wife. They had they got they met at one of our shows. Uh, one of our songs was their wedding song. Aww. Their three sons were all there. One of the, the 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 twelve year old just learned one of our songs on acoustic, and they and one you know then then the other night there's a there's a girl. She's I guess she looks like ten years old. And it says raised. On, she has a T-shirt. It says raised on better than Ezra. It's really cool. I mean, we're we're having more fun and more. Uh, we're just kind of rolling and playing in a state of a, 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 a kind of blissful gratitude that we get to do this 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 dream, this rock and roll dream. That's such a hype dream, yep. you know. And look and be and, and talking to you, you know. You know, do, still doing this thing I love to do and talking to radio and playing the sold out shows. And it's pretty badass. Well, you guys are that band that I mean, because you guys are going to be in Atlanta on November 8th. And, you know, Charlatans are going to they're going to book down 85. No matter how far you are away from us, we're going to find our way to your stage. We will always return. We will always return. Whether you want us to or not, like indigestion, we will always return. You, you got to like the way the music industry is these days where you have better control of what's going on inside that studio. Even if you've come up with an idea in your home studio, you can take it to the bigger guys, and but yet you, you still planted that seed and it's not sitting there on your smartphone. Well, it's really cool. I mean, look, while the... While songwriters aren't getting what we should be getting, right. you know, in this world of streaming and stuff, at the same time, like I'm, I'm always, I've seen it now. Technology come and go, and everybody say it's going to be the end of the record industry. Whether it was, you know, file sharing and Napster, and, and now it's AI. Yep. There's always a silver lining and a new and a new path and a new uh, way for you know, to, to make a living. And right now. There's more control as a songwriter or a young artist than ever. You can sit in your bedroom, make this song on your laptop, upload it to DistroKid or TuneCore or, or SoundCloud or Bandcamp, mm -hmm. you know, and then suddenly your music is available on about a hundred different platforms. And then if you're if you're hustling and, and you've read and you, and you know how to do it, then you can build a social media presence. That's and it. if your songs connect. You you can you could be making you could be making more money per month 
than most signed bands touring just from releasing a few songs. I know several artists who get paid checks from DistroKid or TuneCore, and it's I'm like, I'm jealous. I'm like, are you kidding me? You put out one EP, and this one song took off on TikTok, and you're and you're getting a forty thousand dollar check every month. And then I'm helping this kid invest it. Like, hey, here's a great financial advisor. Good luck. Invest that. You know, it's nuts. You got to come back to the show anytime in the future. The door is always going to be open for you. Brother, thank you so much and, and, and continued success in the writing of stuff. You bet. Same to you. You be brilliant today, okay? I will, brother. You too.